Welcome to the Embodied Woman Podcast. I am your co-host, Amber Sousa, along with Siri Baruch Thornton. And we are so excited to be here with you today for another episode of our Embodied Man mini-series. Right? So we've done we've done one other interview mm-hmm. with Travis Day, who is a human design expert. And today we're gonna have your friend and breathwork facilitator. Um, Falk. Yes. How do you say, how do you say his last name? Henschel. Henschel. Falk Henschel. So, you know this, Amber, but other people don't know is, so Falk and I have been friends for, I want to say like, maybe a couple, maybe a couple years now or a year and a half. I've lost track of time. So he was trained by my breathwork facilitator as well as my breathwork facilitator's facilitator. So he took both trainings. Okay. And that's not actually how I know him. I actually know him because um, a friend of mine, Neil Jackson, who's an actor that I had on the podcast twice um, and who's friends with Jake and I, he recommended Falk to be on the podcast when it was originally the authentic creative just on its own. Yes. And I interviewed because Falk he's an and that's actor, and he's a dancer, he's a creative. Mhm. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so I'm going to read his bio in a minute, but um so I interviewed him. The first interview we did, he was kind of like on set of a film and there was some noise stuff going on and then it didn't record. So then I was like, we got to do this again. So we did a whole nother interview a second time. And I gave him a breathwork session before the interview. So I've interviewed him several times, actually. There's, I think, there's the COVID interview we did, which is on the podcast. That's that's the one that you and I ended up having a conversation about, reflecting on your conversation with him and how to navigate, you know, conversations with people who, may have a different lens through which they're seeing something. Yes. How to have controversial conversations with compassion. So so I've actually never met Falk, but I've listened to the podcast that you did with him. And then you and I had a conversation about that. So I'm really excited to meet him. Yeah. And that was, you watched the YouTube version Mm -hmm. before I turned it into a podcast episode because I was like, I don't know, Amber, is this a good uh, episode to put on the podcast or not. Cause I was feeling right. shy about it. Right. Just because of the nature of talking about COVID and it's kind of triggering and him and I had like these kind of different viewpoints and you were like, well, actually I agree with him. And then yeah. you and I had this like whole conversation, which was really cool. Yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember that you were like, should I, should I, you know, release this? And so I listened to it and I was like, well, first of all, it's interesting because yeah, he and I kind of shared uh, similar viewpoints. And then I was like, okay, so what would be the intention? Right. If we were to yeah, release it. And that's so right. that's what you said. I, I was like, I think that the intention, if we came at it with the intention of helping people witness, you know, individuals having a conversation where they have opposing viewpoints, but like staying in a place of love and respect. And so that, exactly. and I think, I think it, it was really a powerful um, conversation. Yeah. And I think the thing for him was the times that I've had him on the podcast. One time he interviewed me, mm. but the other couple times he had had a breathwork session with me first before I interviewed him. Right. And I know that he has since said, I don't want to do breathwork before being interviewed anymore because it puts him in a place where he doesn't know what he's going to say. <laughs> well, yeah. I remember when I did mine with you, I mean, it took a minute to come out of this, like, <laughs> yeah, you're kind of like you're, woozy you're raw, and you're raw yes. and vulnerable and, yes. and particularly honest, like eight, maybe even more than you. <laughs> yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. It's like if you had just had a couple drinks or something. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. that kind of like open hearted honesty where you come to these realizations, which was fun for me. Yeah. to be able to open people up and have them share in this authentic way. But I think for some people, when they listened back or, you know, that's that like vulnerability it hangover. Vul- yes. Yes. And thank yeah. goodness. Like he has not ever said, will you take 
either of those very vulnerable episodes down because right. he's incredibly revealing in the interviews that I, you know, had with him. He's never said, oh, can you take that down? I, you know, I don't know how people are going to think about me or feel it because that's one of the things that he's taught me is he said to me one time, wow, you really care what people think about you. I was like, like Ouch. yeah, yeah, no, it, I, it didn't hurt as much as I was just like, you're right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, that's exhausting. It is exhausting. It is exhausting. And I feel that I have entered a, a new chapter in my life where I'm experiencing freedom mm -hmm. in a way that I never have before in that area. I, I had this aha moment yesterday. I know he's going to come on in a second, but I had this mm -hmm. aha moment yesterday. I was walking, I went for a really long walk along the beach and it was just so beautiful. And I was listening to Taylor Swift and I was just like feeling like empowered. And I thought, you know, um, I spent so many years, like really desperate for, for somebody like proving to somebody, like, I'm going to prove to you that I'm smart, that I'm capable, mm -hmm. that I'm, and, and you're going to, you're going to see that. Right. And yep. what I real what I realized was particularly one individual who I wanted desperately to um prove yeah. my myself. Yeah. I, I had this aha moment and I was like, this is the good news. That person's never going to approve of me. Mm. And and I don't care. Mm. And I I never needed that person to approve of me. I needed to approve of me. I yep. needed to like, because that's the thing. That's how triggers Preach. are. Right? Like if somebody says to you, like you're whatever, right. And mm -hmm. it's a, it's a core wound of yours. Mm -hmm. You're, you're so wounded by it yeah. because you have that, right. Yeah. If somebody says something to you and you don't, you don't, you're not available for that. You don't actually own that um, belief. Yeah. It's like, it's what we talked about with Jana. Yeah. You, you, yeah. It, it literally, it literally like bounces off of you and you see it in such a different way. And you're like, wow, isn't that fascinating? I, that is not true. Right. And in like fact, my sweater is not, is not black. It's green. That's right. It's green. <laughs> I know it's green. You might think green. it's black. You think it's black. Yeah. And in fact, the funny thing is, is that you're wearing the black sweater. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. So I, I'm wearing green. I know it's green. <laughs> there's nothing you can do to convince me that this is black. There is, and it doesn't hurt my feelings. Like yeah. It literally does not hurt my feelings because uh, there's nothing to hurt. It's, it's They're going to try and convince you that you're colorblind. Right. Oh, they, yeah. There are all but, kinds of, yeah. <laughs> but it's like. That's you know, the gaslighting. That's the gaslighting. So the good news is, is that I'm experiencing this sense of liberation where like, Perhaps momentarily, I'm like, ooh, and then I go, yeah, I never, I never needed. That's the difference between external validation and internal validation. Like, yeah, I can see myself internal. for myself yes. if I know myself deeply enough. That's right. But I think that's the thing that's so great about friends or facilitators or mentors or practices mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that we can see the blind spots through their perspective. Yes. And he's in the also, waiting room, he says. I don't know what he's talking about. We're here. Oh, let me just send him. Does he have the right thing? Um, uh, okay. So you, you, sh you talk. Well, what I was gonna <laughs> say was also, in addition to what you were saying, like writing a book, uh, at, like, is such a healing process for that very thing because I could see myself, I could see where the patterns were born, I could see how they played out, I could see how I chose certain people and certain relationships to unconsciously play out those patterns. And so at the end of the day, all the proving and the needing validation and, and the people pleasing and the codependency, yeah. like it never really was about any of the other people. Yep. And so that's also like, you know, clearing up those blind spots, like writing a book or writing my show or journaling, 
right? Like, because you can see it on paper. You're like, holy shit. It, it really has always been about me, like rediscovering or remembering the truth of who I am. And, and once you really know the truth of who you are, nobody can convince you otherwise. Mm. They can try to convince you, mm. but when you're so grounded in who you are and like, you really know, it, it's like, they can't convince you. Yes. Yay. We see We're your going picture. to read your bio as you're getting settled. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Hi what time is it in well, Germany nice right now? You. Nice to meet you. Yay. I feel like I know um, you. <laughs> likewise. Um, should I wear these? Do you think that's better? Or do you want me to just be as I am? You sound fine. Okay. You sound fine right now. Okay. Okay. I'm going to read your bio. So we are very honored and delighted to have Fal Kanchel here. We've just been talking about all sorts of stuff. Um, amidst the chaos of a pandemic ridden world, Falk, a seasoned Hollywood figure embraced a transformative journey. Falk Henschel, a seasoned Hollywood figure, embraced a transformative journey, seeking inspiration. He, along with his wife, who I've also had on the podcast, Kim, and newborn son, embarked on a nomadic adventure in an A-class RV, immersing himself in diverse experiences. From learning the art of horse wrangling in the Oregon mountains to delving into consciousness expansion work, Falk's path led him to become a breathwork coach. Transitioning away from mainstream Hollywood, he found solace in independent filmmaking. Notable among his ventures is the acclaimed romantic comedy, Swap Me Baby, where he produced and starred as a French gigolo, Philippe. Falk's commitment extends beyond personal projects. He founded Patronage Films to actively support fellow independent filmmakers striving to reshape Hollywood's narrative. Driven by a profound passion for soulful storytelling, Falk stands at the forefront of a movement supported by influential and accomplished figures in Hollywood, all dedicated to inspiring audiences with original, soul-nourishing entertainment. How does it feel to hear your bio being read to you? How does that hit you? does that feel uh it's 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 a new bio it's a new story and uh it's nice to hear still getting some used to you know your old stories you get so used to your old stories um but yeah it's good most of our guests Thanks. have enjoyed hearing their bios read to them because it's just a way of feeling reflected and seen so I'm very excited today because you're two of my absolute favorite people and we're here together. And I'm just, uh, Falk, you've been on the podcast several times we were talking about. Amber obviously was on the podcast several times and then became my co-host. You are both dancers, like not just like, hey, I have fun dancing. You're both like expert trained professional dancers. I know that's not what you're currently doing anymore, Falk, but it's definitely a part of your history. And I kind of want to hear, I don't know how dancers talk, but there must be some lingo. <laughs> Five, six, that you guys, seven, eight. That you guys I'd share. Hear, I'd love to hear how, how you found Dan. I mean, I know for me, right? Like that was just something that I was doing in my parents' bedroom, uh, you know, looking at their mirrored closet doors, like putting on shows since I was, I don't know how, how old. So how, how did dance find you or how did you find dance? My mom got me to dance. Oh. Yeah, she uh, she was a huge Patrick Swayze fan. You know, Dirty Dancing had come out and and uh, she was really sweet trying to support me. My, my idea of finding a foothold in the acting career in Europe was just not happening for like a young teen. There was just not really a path available for me at the time. And she um she was like you should watch dirty dancing and i did and i liked it loved it he's like well that guy was a dancer and then she pointed out other dancers uh fred astaire gene kelly john travolta and she was like maybe you should try dancing and then you'll end up where they ended up and so i started with arthur murray type ballroom dancing just like a dirty dancing and um yeah then it just kind of 
one thing led to the next and I found myself being a professional dancer. Okay, well, can you just tell us, I know this wasn't the plan, but can you just tell us a little bit about the kind of dancing that you got into and like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so from ballroom, it, I got really enamored with, oh, the, the music video backup dancing, the the touring lifestyle, like that that kind of dance. And so I kind of started to study all across the board um, from ballet to hip hop, jazz, contemporary, whatever I could get my hands on. And then I ended up mostly working in that world of, of music videos and, and tours. Um, ended up teaching and choreographing myself and uh, just kind of toured the world with it. So you do were you with still dance now? Do you still use dance as a <laughs> an embodiment practice or a, a way of mm, not as much as I should. Uh there's no should, but not as much as I probably would enjoy. But me and dance have a really odd relationship. Um I never um I never got to just enjoy dancing. I was always very like structured and I gotta like train and become better and do this to get this so that this choreographer will get, you know, like it was a very, it was really like tough. And I enjoyed that for a while, but it kind of killed the, uh, I just want to dance motivation, like freestyle in an audition was always my most horrifying moment. I was like, give me choreography. Let me get it perfect. And, you know, like, so yeah. And so then now that dance is over or the career is over, I sometimes jam out. I'll get the boom box out and if there's a good song, I'll I'll find myself jamming out. But even then, uh, I find myself going, oh man, like your stretch isn't what it was and like, you know, the judgment of that. And so uh, me and dance have a very odd relationship. Yeah, but it sounds it. like you relate it to needing to be perfect. Yep, yep. Yeah. And all my body issues, I've, you know, been really outspoken about this. I've had body dysmorphia and, and you know, um, eating, controlling and overworking out and all that. And that was just fire it up by dance, you know, take your shirt off, you know, you're cut and you're cut because of the way your body is before you even get to dance, you know, so there's all this having to be perfect and having to, you know, keep up and be at the top of your game every day. Um, yeah. I love that you shared that because I think I can relate to I think all of us can relate to having been in the industry and, you know, the thing that we loved performing expression um, was the joy of it was, you know, taken away a bit because it became like a competition for worthiness. Mm. And, and if we got the job, we were worthy. If we didn't get the job, we weren't worthy. And so I know for me in my later years, I am rediscovering the, just the pure joy. Like I mm. actually, last night for my kids went back to their dads and I did, I put on music and I blasted it and I danced for like an hour just by myself, just That's feeling awesome. the music. And it is for me a way of coming back, coming back into my body, coming back to who I am, just, you know, anchoring in, and rooting in. So, um, yeah, well you have That's your awesome. episode. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Falk. Go ahead, just like, good for you. That's awesome that you have that really. Can you, am I, am I chopped off? No, you're good. No, you're good. Oh, yeah. Um, that's, that's... yeah. I, I was just going to say you have the episode that we talked about how dance saved your life, Amber. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think any, any person who um, has, has a need to express creatively if they don't it's like this energy that is being held in that um so so desperately wants to be released and so for me dance i i always felt like i was holding so much extra mm. my own energy and those around me and so for me dance was a way of like releasing the extra mm. that i felt all the time that i felt i was holding i didn't understand what it was or why um but it, yeah. And same with acting. It was a way for me to be in someone else's, uh, a character's experience, but like purge my own yes. uh, emotions and feelings. 
you know? So yeah, expression has always saved me. Yes. Like a safe acting for me, a safe outlet. Yeah. Um, Falk, one of the questions that we always like to ask, and I would love to ask you is, was, what was an experience that you had in your life where you were never the same after? Hmm. Uh, I had a psychosis, a psychotic event when I was uh, 26 in 2008. Uh, that sure changed everything. Um, yeah, I I was already struggling with depression. It wasn't so talked about. I wasn't so aware that it was depression, but just loneliness, sadness, uh, dealing with all the issues I told you about from the dance world and, and kind of feeling like I'm just not getting there. I'm just not getting to self-express the way I want to in my career. I'm alone in the States. I'm a family person. They're all gone. And so then I smoked some weed, which I started very late in life with a acquaintance. And we will never really find out. But when I came into the hospital, they tested my, my blood and urine. And there, there was something in the weed that was not just weed. Um, and the combo of that and not knowing that and the really unsafe space that my entire environment was, I didn't really have a friend, somebody that I felt really safe with, just unhinged my brain. Um, now in hindsight, I think it was a deep, deep awakening in a very unsafe, unguided way. It was like an ayahuasca experience without knowing I took it, without anyone saying, hey, you know, like, it's okay, you're just falling apart. You know, you've been holding it, now you're falling apart. And so, I fell apart, uh, yeah, all the way, you know, all the way of how I conceptualize the world, how I understand the world. And it was a really freeing, I mean, to be really honest, losing your mind like that, A, I was always kind of like my higher self was always aware of it. I wasn't gone, like I wasn't cuckoo crazy. I said crazy things and I believed wildly different things than everybody else. But I also saw myself in the process. And that when you come back, it's kind of nice because you go, okay, well, this whole thing is a mind game. None of this is really real. Mm -hmm. Like the moment you pop, you know, that world that everybody says is real, it ain't real for you. And, you know, I think we've, you know, the world has gotten more experience with depression, psychotic events, burnouts. Um, Sherry, you and I have talked about this. I think in a way we all just went through a mass psychosis during COVID you know um sort of like what is real what do we believe now with ai and i don't know if you guys heard this but like the paris eiffel tower is burning and everybody believes it and then it's like no nah, it's not real so it's like i think we are currently wow. being what is real and what we trust mm -hmm. if it's outside of yourself i think we're in that territory right now where the world can be very confusing and i think people really suffer from that you know before you came on, we were talking about how to trust ourselves and how not to seek outside of ourselves for the truth. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting mm -hmm. you're talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. So because you, like yeah. you said, there there are there are so many different realities, right? What is what you experience as true it could be drastically different than what I experience to be true. And, yeah. and I was telling Siri, like, I, I'm finding liberation and freedom in absolutely knowing who I am and what is true for me and not being as affected as I have in my life before this by other people's projections or beliefs or realities. Um, in the past, I think I was, I was not grounded in who I was. And so I was constantly seeking external validation for what was true. And so that, you know, that <laughs> was not, <laughs> that did not serve me ultimately. So mm -hmm. now where I'm in, I think, you know, with what you're talking about, just really knowing what is true for you and, and being able to, you know, discern. Um, it's yeah, it's very liberating. It's, it's yeah. Liberating. And I think so important at the moment. You know, it's an ongoing game, that thing. And then the nice thing about the psychosis in the beginning, like ne that never went away. I actually, even though my mind wasn't functioning well, many people later told me that my actual intuition and connection to people and like 
picking up on other people's actual emotions and truth was way through the roof. People would come in the room that had a problem with each other, like they just came from a fight. I'm just giving an example. What's this And thumbs I would know up? right away. <laughs> Who Why? are we live with like Facebook or something? I'm confused. <laughs> Is that Someone, a new iPhone thing someone, or when did you do that? The I thumbs didn't do up? that? Oh, did you do that, Falk? There was like a thumbs up just No. now on your screen when you were saying that. We're being hacked. Okay. <laughs> no, no shit. Keep going. <laughs> Um, Who knows? yeah, I think like just saying that the mind being shut down, I think really amped up the, you know, intuition and all the other things to rely on, which is like really connecting in with others and, and your own emotions and making, making new sense of it. So Not after the way you that had you were that, taught. after you had that psychotic break, did that then lead you to wanting to help heal other people? Where did you go from your professional dancer, your professional actor, and then where did the healing part come in? Because I know you're, uh, your mom's a doctor, right? Yep, she is. Um, no, this this was like the beginning of that journey, but the early stages after the psychosis, I just swore myself to never let myself get to a place again where I'm that disconnected from my true self. You know, I I want to be an actor still today. I love acting, and I wanted to be an actor, but I was coming at it from the wrong reasons because. Because quite honestly, coming from the right reasons is really difficult and not supported in the industry. You know, honesty, vulnerability, authenticity. Hey, here's just who I am. Here's what I need. It's very much, this is what you got to deliver. So I shifted that after the psychosis when I went back to LA. And I was like, I got to make sure I'm happy. I got to make sure I'm connected. I then was brought to breathwork to David Elliott. um by a friend of mine and and i was already heavily meditating which i was doing right before the psychosis as well so i was really open through meditation and so that i think also brought on the psychosis because it was unguided um cut forward to david elliott did his breath work um course to become a breathwork facilitator and immerse myself in that and that unlocked all my trauma on the body dysmorphia and all my body issues. And that was mind blowing to me. And just all these traumas in each breath work were just unlocked and 10 years of therapy worth of change came about. And I did that for a good 10 years, parallel approaching my, uh, not approaching, pursuing my career. And, um, but I was saying, ah, I'll, I'm doing all this spiritual stuff for myself. I don't, You know, it's not my thing to do that with others. And cut to, oh, right before the pandemic, depression was setting in again. I had moved to Oregon Bend. I wanted a bit more of a um, environment of nature around me to, to rest and to be more creative. And I wanted to get out of LA, but my depression still was haunting me and it was getting really bad. Um, it's what Amber spoke about, like my... I was struggling to get my creativity out. The projects I was getting wasn't really serving it. I was like, oh, I have this thing I want to do. I want to I want to express this stuff, but I can't find a vehicle. Or I couldn't get the jobs, whatever it was. And we were wanting to have a baby. That wasn't happening. Even though they warn you all your life, just if you're not careful for one second, you get pregnant. And then you're Yep. like, I've been really trying. Oh, my God. <laughs> And I knew, and I knew too, you know, I was at that point spiritual enough to know, well, that kid isn't coming in because you ain't ready. And I was really aware that I did not want to bring in a kid and hand him over this depression, hand him over the, all these traumas that I still have. I was like, I really want to like be consciously aware of that. And it got so bad sitting in a chair staring off that I was like, maybe I should try this ayahuasca that I heard about 15 years prior. from Aubrey Marcus. Mm. Um, and he told me about what it did for him. This was when I saw Aubrey, he was just, he had just like made his first million or something on, on it. And like, you know, he's this figure that like said, Oh, everything changed after ayahuasca. And I was like, well, shit, I want to do that. But I was scared 
Yeah, I was going to um, ask psychosis. you. Well, and then the psychosis made me go, uh, I don't know that I'm the right guy for <laughs> for hallucinogenics. Um, but at this point then, 2019, I was like, I got nothing left here to try. And if I lose my mind again, so be it. Last time it helped me a lot. So might as well risk it. And I found a facilitator that I really trusted that was very grounded um, and did one-on-one work. And that just blew my world up. Mm -hmm. um, I did not found a big company and made billions of dollars yet, but <laughs> yet, it, it yes. just changed. yet, exactly. Yet. Um, but it just changes how you see the world. It, it solved. I mean, it did just to give you some examples. Boy, a, we got pregnant the day after I came back from my session. Uh, wow. Yeah. And my wife, did ayahuasca and met her baby um in her ayahuasca session wow back pain that i've had chronically for 20 years that doctors said should be operated on and all this nonsense gone just gone um and then this perspective shift just sort of oh i actually what i've been through this is energy i i'm capable of feeling how energy runs through the body and where it gets stuck do you know now who that is <laughs> sorry to interrupt you fuck but do you know who that is do you oh, see the do you see it on your screen i don't see it on my screen no okay oh. <laughs> someone keeps thumbs up being you thing. oh i wonder so let's try this i mean it's, it's okay it's fine with us we're just <laughs> like is it happening? Oh. <laughs> no, no. Because there is, I wonder if it can. Read are we, are we like me. streaming onto Facebook or something? Hey, okay. Every now and again, it's like it keeps thumbs up. My wife got pregnant. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, there we go. Spirit, <laughs> spirit cracking through. Okay, okay. So uh, we're talking about you got pregnant. So ayahuasca. This is yeah. This so is ayahuasca. I have not had this. I I have not had any experience with this. So I'm I'm always curious to hear people's experience. Yeah, it's it really opens up another layer of how you perceive the, in my case, everybody has a very different experience. Some people build billion dollar companies. Um, I, I just started to perceive energy. I was like, oh, it's all energetic. I understood this game of like, oh, I understand there's thoughts, there's emotions and underneath it is energy. All of it has underneath it is energy. And I started to get a real physical, visceral experience of that till today. It never left. And in breath work, I'm like, oh, I am moving energy. Now, when I push there, when I do this, like things happen, I just this whole new world kicked open and COVID hit. And I just was like, ah, oh, this breath work stuff is really great. Seems like people are going through it. What, let me just offer this donation based. And I started to offer it to friends with great results and people really loved the work that i was doing and i was like okay maybe i'll keep it up and people just kept showing up in the meantime i'm doing more ayahuasca sessions and getting familiar with it and getting towards the idea of i want to facilitate this or something like it then i started to combine uh cannabis my relationship to cannabis changed after ayahuasca it's i could no longer just smoke it mm. and have a good time cannabis did a very similar thing i was like oh cannabis is a medicine that heightens everything that is present so that you can really hear it people get paranoid it's not the weed that makes them paranoid they're anxious and they're finally hearing it really loudly that they can barely stand it and they want to run out of the room it's like yeah that's your shit that's your that's the energetic signature that you're experiencing and then now that you are experiencing it and accepting it you can work with it you can use breath work, you can use yoga, you can use whatever. Although when that. I breathe, when I, if I've smoked and I breathe, you told me I'm, <laughs> I sucked at breathing, which was true. But, that, because, but that's okay, because you might, in those sessions when we talk, that your body is, you know, part of it was maybe about not being that disciplined and resting. Yeah. And, do you know. Just um, point being like, it doesn't work for everyone in the same way. That's, that's that's, well, that's, I think that's true with all of these things. You know, some people take ayahuasca and see all kinds of stuff. I don't, 
I had had some really beautiful visions with open eyes, but I'm not somebody that trips and just goes like, whoa. Um, some people hear sound, uh, sorry, hear color, and some people see music. Um, my thing was, I feel the energy current. Um, I experience what is going on in the room or what's going on with the client. I'm like kind of like connected to it and it's kind of like just going through me at the same time. While my brain is going, I got no idea what this feeling is, but it's sadness and tears. And then the client is crying at the same time. You know, it's just yeah. these experiences started to happen more. And that kind of stayed around that way. Still doing that on a donation base, kind of just staying open, saying if somebody finds me, um and i love working with people and i love cheerleading for them and i love just helping them figure out like what is it that they're holding on to what is the experience that they're living that they're unaware of that they're actually creating it and that it's all okay but how can you shift to the next you know iteration of you again and again and again you know not so much a fixing something that's broken more of a just make the ride a little smoother. You know, it's going to continue. It'll never change. I mean, it'll never stop. So coming. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I have a question about um, what you have discovered. Your depression is a symptom of you. You shared that you have experienced depression throughout your life, right? Starting as a young boy and you. No, no, not starting no. as a young boy. Mm -mm, no, it started as um. As a young boy, the depression, the worst it got was boredom, you know, boredom and not knowing what to do and being stuck in that and feeling uncomfortable with that. But it wasn't depression. Depression started when I went out in the world at a young age, like 18, I moved to London. And that's when it's like percolated. Okay. And it really hit me in Los Angeles when I felt isolated. It wasn't at all what I thought it was going to be. Mm. It felt LA very difficult for me to be authentic vulnerable which was something i was just used to doing there was no there was never an inhibition on that mm. but in la i was like i just for some reason in this room i don't feel like i can just just be 100 percent me i think that might be dangerous mm -hmm. ah okay so um, you so felt like I, you had to guard so that guard. energy you talk about energy so you felt like you had to shut down parts of yeah. yourself yeah, yeah, shut down parts of myself, uh, like confine myself, put myself in these boxes. And now it's developed into, because I still have it now at times, I just went through a bout of depression. And I don't even know if I would call it depression anymore, but a bout of real bad discomfort with the world and myself in it. Um, and now I'm, I'm understanding it as, I mean, I'm an actor, so I chose to feel for a living. And I love feeling it's cathartic. Like I, I'm like, give me something to feel for you. And that's what I do with my clients. I'm like, let me feel with you and let me hold the space for that. It's very easy to do it for others or for an audience. But I started to notice that I think I'm just really open to strong emotions. And when you get depressed, I think it's often kicked off by something in your life. But in my case, the last one I had, you look around and I go, well, there's some tough stuff in my life, but the proportions of what I'm feeling, it doesn't relate to what's going on around me. And so I started to sort of go, well, what if I'm just feeling intense things? The world is going through stuff. There's stuff from my ancestors, from my parents, from friends. You know, you're, you're talking these days, I don't know about you guys, but everyone is going through horrible shit. You know, so many people that you're talking on the phone are sharing their stories. And I think our bodies process that. And I'm, I think I signed up to sort of feel it. And I think whenever I'm not aware that it's kind of my job or something that I actually just do, and I get all like, oh, why am I feeling it? And why is life so tough? Like when I get into that space, that's when it becomes a depression because I, you contract on it. You hold on to it. You identify with all the the yeah. yucky feelings and you think it's you but the truth is no you're just feeling it just sit down relax breathe and it, it'll pass and also at some point tell it to wait or step aside you got to take care of your son or you got to have some fun um that's my newest approach i'll tell you if that's going to work but um <laughs> that's how i'm kind of identifying 
underlying my my depressions these days. So embodiment for you has changed over the years, yeah? Or is it similar? Like what stayed the same and what's changed? Well, can you define embodiment for me? Well, actually, that's one of our questions for you because it's we different. We want you to define it. It's different for no, everyone. Different I mean, let's jump to that one maybe because. <sighs> what is it for you? When I think uh, embodiment, for me personally, I'm embodied when I am authentic, truthful, and present. I think that's really as simple okay. as that. Whenever I can remain present, authentic, and truthful, I'm fully embodied. And then that will, whatever I touch, whatever I do physically, whatever I say, I think it will all be embodied. And the, verse, the reverse is true, too. You know, when I'm not present... And I'm reacting to stories of the past or fears of the future. And I'm, I'm acting out of those places. I think that's when I'm not embodied. Mm -hmm. And all these experiences I've talked about, I'd say they've made me more aware when I'm slipping out of embodiment. And they have gotten me to a place where I wake up much faster when I've been not embodied um, for a little while. You know, you... I used to go on stint months, probably not being embodied. And then now it's like, now we're here five minutes there, or, you know, this action was not embodied. And that one was, it's a, you know, it's a fluid process for me. I, I can't say that I'm living in an embodied experience all the time. Well, you're a human, we are human. So you, but you have the awareness of when you are feeling present and authentic. What was the other thing you said? Present, authentic, truth. truthful and truthful. Yeah. So your, your human self is aware when you're not feeling truthful, present and authentic. And you yeah. notice how that feels in your body. And then do you have specific, when you notice that, what are the tools that you, obviously breath work is one of them. What are some of the other go-tos that you, that you have in your tool? toolkit to help you come back into truth, authenticity, presence? Um, I have this lovely little routine that I do every 24 hours. At the moment, it's in the morning, but I try to just keep to it every 24 hours. And it's 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 just a sort of like check in whether you actually are have been present or are you have you been on autopilot? And it's a it's the power hour. Gorain Jones. Um, I got that from yeah. him. He's life coach and it's basically a check-in a 20-minute check-in on your body your mind and your soul and the way I do that is 20 minutes I set a timer and I just sort of go what what's is there something hurting is something off does that need what kind of movement does that need do I need to stretch do I need to walk uh, do I what like what is it that I'm desiring to connect with in my body I, I want to feel strong it's push-ups today I just kind of free flow but I keep moving I keep physically engaged in my body for 20 minutes. Timer is up. Then I switch over to um, journaling, just cleaning up the thoughts. What are you thinking? Like, are you sad? I Like, where are you today? Um, I try to end that with sort of gratitude. Jake, uh, serious husband, has given me a lovely little piece that I added, which is reverse visualization. You know, you visualize the goal that you want. And once you did that, you go a little back and you go for that to come true. I need to visualize this. And you just work your way to the now and sort of set intention for the day. And then I go to the third 20 minutes, which is I use Wim Hof because it's a nice app that does the similar breathwork technique that I'm used to. But somebody says, breathe in, breathe out. And I just meditate and cold shower before all that. And then I just kind of start up my day. So that's like a, a daily tool just to like keep it well oiled and it gets me through life pretty well. And then when I'm really floundering, when I am have been asleep or on autopilot, um, my body usually punishes me or I shouldn't say punish. My body helps me out real quick. I get those old back pains I had or those old chronic things that I've had with me for decades, they'll flare up. And I know which one is related to what issue. 
sometimes there's new things and I'm like, Siri and I will talk about it. You know, it's like, when we both had the toe thing, <laughs> toe thing or something in the body happens where I go, ah, what is okay. I'm clearly not paying attention and it's been going on for a while. So it's energy has now become more solid into tension in the body. And I usually try to go to breath work immediately, like a 45 minute intense session, probably with some medicine. Um, not always. And when I get really desperate, like I, I can't find my way out. I just, I pray, I stay open. And the thing that got me out of my last um, depression was the movie Forrest Gump. I just, it's a movie I love. I watch it all the time. And my depression was related to uh, this industry isn't made for me anymore. What am I doing here? And I just needed to watch that movie to remind myself of why I think it's a great art form and why I need to, you know, be a champion of it. And call a friend. Mm -hmm. Call a friend. And I was lucky I had a friend call me. He saw my posts on Instagram, which also is another tool. Share, share with people that you're not doing well. I started doing that on Instagram. Some people are like, I don't know that you should post that. It might not be good for business. And I'm like, well, well let's not kid ourselves. Like, I'm not saying I can't function, but I'm sad. I'm not doing good. And what yeah. happens? Beautiful friends like Siri reaches out. And uh, one of my mentors reached out and was like, hey, just reminding you of this. Ah, okay. Thank you. I'm back on track. You know, some, sometimes it's as simple as that. And it gives other people permission to see that they're liberated by you sharing honestly, truthfully, authentic, vulnerably, and you know they're more likely to do the same thing. I think we're shifting out of that age of pretending everything's perfect right. into vulnerability is the age we're in now, truthfulness. I love that. <laughs> I, I want to, no, I, really I just want to, oh, go ahead. No, I was just, I really love, this has been my thing that I, I haven't found value for in, in my career, in my life. Um, and I just love it. I love when people can be authentic and vulnerable. They're so good. Like people are at their best when they're there, even if they might think that they're broken. Mm -hmm. But if you're authentically broken and sharing it, like you have no idea how powerful that is. Yeah. And how, and this is, this was done in a movie that my son was watching, the, the, oh, the one with the emotions, the Pixar movie, mm -hmm. Inside, Inside Out. Out. Inside Out. You know, it was so beautiful. It's like, yeah, like if you, if you authentically share yourself, you activate the superpower in, in most of the humans around you. We are not, we recognize honest despair, honest problem, honest, I need help. And we, function we go there we embrace it we go what can i do like we're good we're good people and this this uh, honest expression of pain i think is one of those things that activates that you know in our environment so i'm glad i'm glad you're saying that that we're in that age mm -hmm. of vulnerability yes yes and um i was gonna say uh when you were when you were sharing that i just we fall in love with people when we get to see who they truly are. And yeah. I was feeling love for you when you were sharing so vulnerably and beautifully. And I was thinking about how most of us have spent much of our life lives wanting to hide the parts of ourselves that we feel we could be judged for. But those parts are the parts that people fall in love with. That yeah. Those are the parts that help us have the connection and the intimacy that we all really, really, really want. And I love yeah. having conversations with men about this because as a woman, it, it feels, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels more natural or safer in our culture for me to express emotionally as a woman than the, the conditioning that men have had to, you know, move through. And so I love getting to see how, even though men and women are very different in many ways, in many ways, we're, we're not like we, we, we all want to feel seen and validated and loved and heard. We all want to be able to be our authentic selves and be present. And, you know, it's, and I, so I love that you're sharing that and your practice that you shared is, is so wonderful. And 
I think what I really got to when you were saying that it's, it's not about getting to a place where we're like feeling good all the time, every day, even though that's what I would prefer, but it's, I'd love that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's about the practice and the awareness and the willingness to move through it. And also what you said, and I identified with this, not like attaching to the story, like just noticing it going, Oh, there's sadness is coming through right now. Okay. What, what's going on rather than like, crawling into bed with the sadness and like going down this, you know, the whole story. It's what I am. Life. It's everything yeah. I am. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. No, I know. But like, just I, I really, it. I, I, I really hope, I mean, listen, I'm going to lie. If I would say, Oh, I don't want to get there. I can't wait to get there. You know, like that's why I feel like I'm not, and this might sound, but what she's saying is there's no there, there is no there. No, I know. I know. Right. But well, I mean, who knows, right? Death, who knows what death is uh, and what that brings us to, like what's after that. But yeah, the, I think there, I think there really is no there. And I think the only there is like, how, how are you doing it? Yeah. How are you experiencing it? And um, yeah, how are you, how are you going to tell your story again and again and again, you know? Not and just the one there, nothing. the there is, if you are embodied, is this present moment. Yeah. Yes. And it's I here. know for me, the more that I practice all the things that we all practice, the more experience, the more I experience freedom, the more I experience peace, not always, but more of that in the yeah. present yeah. moment. So I think that is the, the there that we all want. We all want to experience more freedom, more love, more intimacy, more connection, more peace, more expression, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and these tools help us experience that more than not. Yeah. I'm curious about the conditioning you received growing up to be, what was it to be a man to you? And what are you discovering as you get older and into being a father and storyteller? What is that now? I'd like to kind of unravel this. Yeah, here, let's go. It was like a therapy session. I love it. <laughs> I mean, we just talked about that with my with my mom because they were here for this this depressive phase, and you know, and I I did a mushroom. I work with psilocybin a lot, and I'm I did a mushroom journey. And my conditioning at home, I've been really really fortunate. I was conditioned to feel a lot of love. Mm -hmm. I always say the light of the love, like knowing that I'm loved, that's, it's, it can't be extinguished. I never suffer that. I never feel alone in the love. I feel very, very strong in that. My parents did a wonderful job with that. Um, I was given a lot of courage. I was conditioned to be courageous. And then to the shock of my mother, where I was like, mom, I mean, what did you think? I was like, bulimic anorexic. I was like, I, I don't have any self-confidence. I was conditioned and my mom was like, well, yeah, I guess I didn't model that because I don't have it either. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Both my mom and I are both people where everybody, when we say that, people go, what? Right. You're the most confident person I know. And I, I said, and my mom said this to me and I said, no, 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 I'm very courageous. I'm not saying I won't go through shit. I go through anything. I'll face everything. But I'm not, you know. And I have self-trust. Like, I know I have this deep trust that things will work out. Otherwise, I think I'd be dead. Um, but the confidence of, like, stepping into a room, whether that's auditioning, dancing, I've always humble pied it. And every time I try to, like, build that confidence, I've had in an environment where people told me, you need to eat some humble pie, boy. You know, so that's been my conditioning is to just stay in that sort of, like, be humble and... You're not all that. And like, who are you to do this? Who are you mm -hmm. to ask for that? Um, not by my parents. They didn't do that to me, but they didn't live an example. And this is more my mom. Mom, I love you. Um, and she's aware of this. So I feel comfortable talking about it. Um, and my dad, as far as like being a father, strong sense of taking care of people. Both my parents, they're both doctors. They're both, my house was always full. My parents always took care of whoever didn't have what they needed. They, we have some, a friend of mine right now at the Praxis getting treatments and being helped by my parents. And uh, so I got a big sense of like 
take care of the like take care of the people that you love and that's very masculine to me in the sense this sort of like i got you um and also a bit of toughness you know like i think my my father we did a mushroom journey together and uh, i i got so close to him because i got to look at his face and go because he sometimes might be somebody that seems angry or like just really like passionate and wants to like destroy the stuff that's in the way of like a better world mm -hmm. but i got to look through that and i went oh you just feel just as much as i do but you're not an actor you were right. never taught how to just you know just let the tears flow or uh, use other ways than to like hold that shit you know and build up a strong body to just endure it I have a a client who had a stroke, 70 years old, bless his heart that he's coming to me, very like not spiritual at all, but he just heard of this through my mom. And, you know, we talked and he was like, show feeling like it was just so we shared about this, like conditioning that as a man, you just, that's not safe because then your family feels like the ship is going to sink. Yeah. Yeah. If the father is dropping the, the sword and going to his knees and saying, I can't do it, you know, releasing just, just for that moment, I can't do it no more. I need to be held. That means death. Mm -hmm. Right. That's mm -hmm. talking ancient conditioning. Yeah. We, we kind of kept that going and going and going. And even now that women are making money and we're not sole breadwinners anymore, but I still think there's this like, I got to at least energetically keep shit together for everybody, you know, and I definitely have that. Um, so yeah, that's the conditioning on, on that end. What was the other one? Oh, the business. This, I'm curious about the societal conditioning. Do you feel you've gotten not just from your family, but as like what you're, what you're meant to be as a man? I mean, you talked a little bit about LA. Yeah. I, I mean, I think I was kind of, a little protected from the societal thing just based on my like my family never trusted society in a way other than community because we come from east germany so we were like news government the greater picture of societal things is all bullshit we just got to like survive as a family so i'm very very like my friends my family things i can see oriented however I think the industry conditioned me to seek power in order to be authentic. Oh, interesting. And I, and I think that happens the moment you get your first agent, you know, they, you come in as the actor and you go, well, you know, I love Braveheart and Forrest Gump. And I just really want to express this vulnerable strength. And I want to find projects that talk to me and that really move me. And they're like, well, here's what you got to do though you got to do this and this and this and then you got to become a superhero and you got to you got to be somebody first and forget all that motivation get motivated this way because we need to make you something of power first you have no value until the industry says so because mm -hmm. only people with value get to make choices of what they actually want to play who they actually want to work with are you a name? Because um, if you're not a name. Yeah, are you a name? Yeah, like where are you on the star meter? I mean, like star meter, that was a thing. I remember yes. I checked my star meter and when star meter was in the top thousand, I was like, oh shit, you know, maybe I can finally have some confidence. But then it dropped to 10, you know, a week later and you're like, fuck, I'm nothing. And now it's Instagram. <laughs> and now it's Instagram. Well, thank God I, I was too old. Like I'm just not too old, but I just, I'm a techno technological grandpa. Um. I'm like, I don't get it. <laughs> so it um, never really reached me that much. So because the embodied man, we would kind of look at Hawkman as maybe like a version of an embodied man, which you played. <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> it, I never watched. I, I don't know. I mean, you tell me. What do you think? Oh, Hawkman, that chapter, bless his heart. Um, it was a rough experience. And no, I mean, I, I think my, my biggest struggle with that character was that I, I felt all these beautiful opportunities to embody some stuff, you know, to go, well, 
incarnation this guy's done it 206 times and remembers all of it and he's loved 206 times the same woman and he's seen the world grow up like what is all that you know what is all that pain what is all that stuff to express but we focused on you know muscle and 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 gravitas and like coolness and and right. a little bit of love a little bit of romance but we never delved into these more spiritual areas or these very emotional areas that I was so in love with when I got the part. I was like pumped. I was like, yeah, I got these ideas, you know, um, what if, what if, and, you know, to nobody's fault, you know, was what it was. Um, I just didn't get to, to live that. So I was, yeah, it was a, it was an interesting journey. I have something to say by Amber. I want to let you have a moment if you have anything you want to share. Oh, I was thinking um, a, earlier, a question that I had um, that I, we've never asked this before, but we talk a lot about like, what does it feel bodied? But you were, you were sharing how you feel other people's energy. And so I would, I'd be curious to hear when you're in the presence of someone, whether they're a man or a woman, um, who is embodied, what is that, what is your experience of them? How does that feel energetically? Um, it's just so delicious. It's a safe, inspiring, admiring, a turn on, not, not necessarily in a sexual sense, it can be, but a turn on for life. You know, I'll give you an example. I, I just wrangled horses in the mountains this last summer with this cowboy who uh, I call him a, a Zen cowboy, old school cowboy who's been pushing cows and, you know, taking people on the mountain on horseback for like uh, decades and decades. And just watching him with his herd at a slow pace, but a steady pace, his strength, his like joy that he has for his job and nature and just really being present and not needing to be anywhere else never they he doesn't have a phone you know I mean, he has the phone but he when we work there's none of that he's content with every moment and so um i almost want to say artistically engaged with every moment you know that in being in that presence you just you feel safe you feel like wow you know people are happy that's the other thing you sit across from these people who are in those moments and some seem to live there um, of embodiment and you're just like good for you that's that's what i what i say a lot i'm just like good for you i'm so happy that that is where you live and i can only aspire to to learn more from you and and accumulate more of that time for myself you know until one day you you created a, a pattern you know a pattern of keeping yourself in that state i love that i love that so much I just, I, so what you just talked about was when you are in the presence of someone who is embodied, you feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wrote a book. It's coming out in February. I'm really excited. And one of the, one of the parts that I talk about at the end was, um, you know, some of the things that women have gone through, um, uh, you know, for example, uh, we weren't allowed until 1974 to, um, even apply for credit cards in our own name. We weren't allowed to have bank accounts in our own name. We weren't allowed to um, get uh, contraception uh, until 1972 unless we were married. So there were, you know, attempts to um, take our power away, I would say. And the and this is what I perceive was that 